Hello and welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to tell you about the additional displays that I use when I travel. Welcome back and thanks for being here. You may have noticed in my previous videos, particularly the D-Doc video, that I have additional displays that I mount when I travel. If you've seen my ham radio video, then you also know that at one point my ham radio display was mounted forward of the gear shift. And that made for a really cool photo with the ham radio, the gear shift, and I think I captured some plaid seating in that same photograph. And those are elements that you don't normally see together. So it's a cool photo, but I had to move the ham radio so that I could mount the D-Dock. So what I did was uh, I had initially put the ham radio display above the MIB2 display so it was blocking an air vent and that wasn't a terrible thing. The hardest part about that was rerouting cables. I had to remove a charging cable and then install the data cable for display and I ran that through the AC duct. Later I decided that I wanted to delve into some overlanding and I don't exactly have an overlanding vehicle or rig but I still wanted to experiment and dabble a little bit. And that meant that I needed uh, more display. I mean, it's not always necessary, but I really wanted to dive in and, and play with it. And so I did, back when I had my phone mounted up high, I did like having a map display here and a map display here, because I'd put Waze on one display and then Google Maps on another. I also liked to bring up traffic in Google Maps and look ahead so that I can see a traffic jam maybe 10 miles up the road and make a decision about taking an early exit or something. And so I have liked the idea of additional displays and being that I wanted to tinker with some overlanding software and just, I don't know, I told you in the last video I'm a techno weenie, right? So I wanted to play around with it. And, and mount everything in a manner that was not terribly distracting or difficult to manipulate uh, while I drive. And for the most part, it's not. So let me give you, uh, I mean, I've shown you a few photos, but let me go ahead and show you what everything looks like right now. So on a day-to-day -day basis, as I drive, my my display looks like this. This is, this is every day I, I run ways during my commute and I listen to music. What you may or may not have seen in the, any previous videos is a small hint to the presence or absence of my displays. And that would be in the form of this connector right here. So it used to be I had my ham radio display mounted here. And then when I moved it, I moved it over to the side duct, which is off over here. And so... Um, those are the only hints of anything even existing. And it's, I don't know, some people might consider it an eyesore, but it, it doesn't bother me. And then when I'm ready to use something, I go ahead and I mount it. So let me show you the mount that I use. It is basically a modified Pro Clip. So you might recognize the Pro Clip. Let me turn that around the right way. And then it has this steel plate. Now, this steel plate is uh, the backing plate for the ham radio display. The ham radio display has these uh, magnetic discs on it. And the, it, the plate is made specifically for the ham radio. And so, obviously, I, I, I mean, I suppose I could change it, but why would I? I mean, it, it works really well. So, I decided to duplicate that for whenever I mount my tablet which is the second display. So I just got another backing plate and stuck it on the back of my tablet. So let me see if I can get this thing mounted with one hand. I've, I've never tried, I didn't rehearse this. So let's see what happens when I go to put it up here. I gotta get the bottom one in underneath. Whoops, is that where that goes? Yep. There. Now, to mount it, I gotta just pull a little bit of wire out there. There's my charging cable. The toughest part is lining up the disc, especially with one hand, because right now I have no reference for where it mounts. I need to move it left. 
There we go, locked in. And I plug it in. Flip this out of the way. And there we go, that there is my additional display. And from there, I can load Google Maps. Let's see if it loads. I don't recall if I have uh, my internet set up or not. Oh, there we go, it's downloading. So there's my, there's my maps and you can see that I bring up the traffic so I can look and see how traffic looks. And I can also bring up Torque Pro. And so here I am set up with the various gauges. And so obviously with the car off, it's not gonna really show that much in the way of gauges. I'll, um, I'll start it up for you here in a minute. So now let me move over here to the ham radio display. The ham radio display is slightly different. It's still a um, it's still a a pro clip. It's just a different shaped pro clip. It is a little a little taller. A little awkward looking, I guess. Let me see if I can get this thing in. There we go, so now uh, the ham radio is turned on. Here you can see I've got the, uh, uh, the car running so that you can see the working gauges. So I have uh, the intake air temp, which is after the intercooler. This is the catalytic converter temperature, which is sort of an exhaust gas temp. Uh, you'd be surprised how high that gets on a uh, on a good acceleration, a good sprint. I've never pegged it at 1500 degrees, but I've gotten it up there pretty high. And I know I didn't even take it up there terribly high. And this is not necessarily EGT because true EGTs are before the turbo. And to my knowledge, there's not a place to sample that temperature. And so if I'm getting, if I can get this up to over 1400 degrees at the cat, that means prior to the turbo, it's even hotter. So, um, I don't, I'm pretty confident that the software would back everything off before I let everything get out of control, but it's, this is mostly entertainment value, right? Uh, this tells me what the load of the car is. Right now it's at 3%. And then this boost gauge, um, I'm not sure how accurate it is. It's not as inaccurate as the, the one that's built into the, um, into the MIB2 interface, but I need to see if I can find a, a PID, a custom PID. And speaking of custom PIDs, I also have, um, I've got the coolant, which I can see over here in, that, in the dash if I want, but I can't bring the oil temp up anywhere. I'd love to have that. So if you know a custom PID that will bring up oil temperature, please share it. I, I don't know where it is. And so uh, I've got my compass here. I've got the uh, ECU voltage which we don't have a way to display voltage anywhere. Uh, coolant air temperature that's outside air temp so I can compare the air temp to the intake temp. And then I've got my bearing, which is also which direction I'm traveling. And then I've got the trip odometer here, which I use on long trips. I like to stop every 100 miles. And if I lose track, then this will tell me how many miles I've driven. And then I like to, just for giggles, sometimes compare the GPS speed to what the ECU, how fast the ECU thinks I'm going. Again, none of this is necessary. Gauges are purely for entertainment value. As long as the car is running properly, there's no need to have a gauge. It's once I'm troubleshooting, for example, if my alternator goes out or if my battery went out, I could look at the voltmeter. A coolant, this will tell me if it's overheating, but then so will the display over here and nearly everything else is just purely 
entertainment value. So I don't place any value on this stuff at all. But what I do like to do is bring up Google Maps. And I'll run Google Maps and Waze together because Waze is great for telling me where certain obstacles are, the police, for example. And uh, Google Maps is better for telling me about traffic because I can look out further ahead to see where traffic jams might be so that I can navigate around them. And Google Maps also is better for providing directions to unknown places. A very popular place, yeah, Waze will handle it, but especially by voice. If I say the magic words to wake up the, uh, uh, the Google and then I say navigate to and then I name a place, Waze almost always screws it up, almost always where Google Maps gets it right most of the time. So, um, yeah, so sometimes I like to have them both going, especially on a long road trip. And then, of course, the ham radio, um, that's already, that's pretty self-explanatory. I, I don't really use the ham radio so much when I'm traveling uh, with my wife. To me, it's kind of like talking on the phone when you have company, I, I consider it to be rude. And so I only talk on the ham radio if I'm traveling by myself and I'm gonna be on the road for more than an hour. During my commutes, no, never. It's This ham radio is put away most of the time because the commute is too short to bother with ham radio. And um, on, a long, on a long road trip, yes, I'll bring it out and I will talk on the radio, so. That's pretty much the extent of the multiple display setup. Let me know if you have any questions um, let me know if you'd like me to do a better video on my ham radio setup. I've linked it. You can go check it out. Um, I've shot it years ago, and uh, it's just a voiceover, but it'll give you a general idea. But if you want to know more about it, feel free to post a question, and I'll be glad to share. Um, feel free to let me know that all of this is completely unnecessary, and I, I recognize it's all entertainment value, but that's what I do. Um, I'm very disciplined about not being distracted by it, on the road. This is more like an open highway setup. I uh, certainly don't commute with all of this mess. It's That would be too distracting in city traffic. But um, yeah, on the open highway when there's nobody there, it's, it's all very, it's just another display, a quick glance that I can check something out. And, uh, and I like it. Again, it's the tech weenie in me that, that does this stuff. So <laughs> feel free to ask questions and I will talk to you next time. Take care.